church on Sunday, July the 31st, 2022. I'm Carol Fletcher, and I'm joined in worship leadership today by Jeff Cook, and we have Hannah Cole and Crystal Shaw as our music leaders today. We are gathered today in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. For thousands of years, Indigenous people walked this land and knew it to be the center of their lives and their spirituality. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thanks be to God for this time we have together. Amen. I invite you, as you are gathered here in Trenchcona Memorial, uh, to join us as we stand and sing our introit from the More Voices hymn book. We sing, There is Room for All. Thank you. 
which is printed in the order of service bulletin, let us pray together as we are able. God of grace, guide us into the life you offer. Give us wisdom to place our trust in Christ rather than in possessions and wealth. Give us hearts to create caring communities in which all people are honored. Give us faith to create communities that seek the well-being of all people. God, bless us to be a blessing in your creation. Amen. It's part of the tradition of the T. Bajigan congregations to sing a verse of All Things Bright and Beautiful. I'll invite the congregation to remain seated through this hymn, but I invite you to turn in Voices United to hymn 291. The last time you are gathered at Transcona Memorial, we sang verse 1. For this week, we are going to sing verse 3 of hymn 291. We begin with the chorus, we sing verse 3, we end with the chorus. All things bright and beautiful. gospel reading comes from the gospel of Luke. In this passage, someone tries to get Jesus to take their side in a family dispute. And as he often does, Jesus responds by telling a story. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And Jesus said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? He said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. He said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, and I will build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. And may God speak to us through these words of Scripture. Amen. Our hymn is in the More Voices hymn book. It's number 127, I Saw the Rich One. Number 127.
tear down a couple of the barns that I have, and I'll have my slave, oops, meet my workers. So difficult to remember the politically correct term. I'll have my workers build a couple of really humongous barns. Who could that be? It says, unknown caller. Probably somebody wanting some of my money. It's not easy being king. Being king and being rich. Number says it's from one, 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 one. Who gets all number ones for their phone number? You would think the king should have that. Oh, the king, that, that would be me. Hello? I'm just going to put you on speakerphone so I can count my money while we talk. Hello, Solomon. Hello. I'm afraid you know my name, but I don't know who you are. My display screen lists you as an unknown caller. Well, that's appropriate since I seem to have been unknown to you for quite a while, at least since you became king. Like I said, I know who you are, but uh, you know who I am, but I don't know who you are. I am who I am. That's not all that helpful. I also am who I will be. Well, it's been nice chatting with you. I am who I am, but I'm going to hang up now. Solomon, it's me. It's God. You're God. Well, some people say I have an inflated sense of importance. <laughs> I know we haven't chatted in a while, Solomon, but I am God. I wanted to talk to you about your plan to tear down some of your barns just to build bigger ones. How do you know about that? I just thought about that a minute ago. I haven't had time to tell anybody else what my plan is. Solomon. Remember to whom you're speaking? I am God. Oh yeah, well, I guess if you are God, then you would know, wouldn't you? I know lots of things. So, why do you want to build bigger barns? If you're God, you probably already know why. I do, but I'd like to hear it from you. Humor me. You're not quite what I was expecting, God. You'd be surprised how many people say that to me. Now, about these barns. There just never seems to be enough room to store everything. My subjects are having an exceptionally good year with their crops. Maybe I have you to thank for that. Anyway, as I was saying, last few years have been record crops, which is great because most of what they grow comes to me. But now I need more infrastructure for storing all of it. Wait. Why does most of the grain they grow come to you? How much do they get to have for themselves, their families, their communities? I'm reasonable. They get enough to keep enough to make some bread and to stay well enough to grow the crops and to harvest them for me. But why do you need to take so much of the crop from them? Well, because I'm king, obviously. I'm the most important person around here, so I should get more. Besides, giving is good for them. It allows them to show how much they love and respect their king. And it's not like they don't get anything in return. My army is always there to protect them. I suppose your army is also there to ensure that the people give you most of their harvest. Well, they do sort of multitask. I still don't understand why you take so much of the crops. Oh, I'm king. I'm the king. You never know when some visiting dignitaries might show up and I, I'd have to lay out a feast for them. And you never know for sure when there might be a famine. And if there's a famine, I'm sure the people would want to know that their king and their king's staff were well fed and healthy and able to keep things running smoothly. So let's see if I understand this. People living in the villages outside of the city grow the crops of wheat and barley and vegetables and figs and grapes 
And then you, as the king, you tax them, taking most of the crops. In fa fact, you take so much of the crops that you cannot use all of it. So you want to build bigger and bigger barns so that you can store more and more of the crops that someone else grew but doesn't get to eat. Yeah, that sounds about right. <coughs> Huh. Huh. Do you know who you remind me of? My dad, King David, slayer of Goliath, second king of Israel, always one of your favorites. No, not David. You remind me of Joseph. Joseph? You mean Joseph, Jacob's kid? Joseph, the, the interpreter of dreams? Yes, that Joseph. That's okay. Wouldn't mind having one of those Technicolor dream coats like you have. No, if I had one of those, I bet someday somebody would write a musical about me. <laughs> Joseph worked for Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. That's right. Good work if you can get it. After Joseph predicted that there would be a famine, Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of gathering, storing, and stockpiling the harvest from people's crops. Oh, that Joseph sounds like someone I could use in my staff. Not everyone thought so. First, Joseph collected all the food that was grown. Then when people came to him for food, he took their money until no one had any money left. Then he took the livestock in exchange for food. Then when the people had nothing left with which to buy food, they sold all their lands to Pharaoh, and the people became Pharaoh's slaves. Joseph had a nice coat, but a bad attitude. I'm sure Joseph and Pharaoh were just looking out for everyone's welfare. That's what I do. Okay, so I collect most of the food and the money and the land, but I keep everyone safe. We have to feed our army. We have to make sure they can protect us. After Joseph came Moses. <laughs> Pardon, I thought we were talking about me. Eventually, people complained about being slaves complained about Pharaoh owning everything, complained about a ruler who, o who ordered them to build bigger and bigger barns and storage units. I'm, I'm sure they just needed to see the bigger picture. The people cried out, and I heard their cries, and I sent Moses to tell Pharaoh that my people were not going to live like that so Moses led the people out of Egypt, led them into the wilderness, led them into this place where you now are king. And believe me, God, I'm very glad Moses did that for you. In a way, you make it possible for me to become king. While they were in the wilderness, Moses and I taught the people how to live as community, how to respect and care for everyone, how to share food so that everyone has as much as they needed and no one collected too much. I gave them commandments to follow so they would not create a society like Pharaoh's. They would not be ruled over, but they would live as neighbors, as friends, as all my children. Well, that was good advice, but as I recall, the people eventually decided they wanted to have a king. Just like all the other nations had. A king to look after them. Someone wise. Maybe someone like me. One day, people will write about Moses and about the people who wanted a king. They will write a book called Deuteronomy. And in that book, they will say that I did allow the people to have a king. But I said their king was to be different than the pharaoh. In that book, they will write, I will say this about their king. The king must not acquire many horses for himself or return the people to Egypt in order to acquire more horses. Since God has said to you, you must never return that way again. Doesn't sound to me like that book of Deuteronomy will be a really bestseller. <laughs> there will be another book written. It'll be called First Kings. A book about kings, that's more like it. I hope I get mentioned. Ah, you do, Solomon. Here is a sample of what that book will say about you. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots, 
and 12,000 horsemen. Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Pew. Interesting, isn't it, that one book says the king must not acquire many horses or return the people to get Egypt to horses, and the other book will say that you have 40,000 horses and you sent buyers to Egypt to get them. Different times. We need an army. Egypt has what we need. There will be other books written. Some of them will be about a prophet named Jesus. And Jesus will tell the story of a rich person who pulled down all his barns in order to big, build bigger ones to store all the grain and the things that he owned. While the slaves were doing that, the rich person relaxed and ate and drank and thought about how he had nothing to worry about. I like this Jesus. I like this story about being rich. I make an appearance in that story too, Solomon. I tell the rich person that he's a fool and he will die that very night and all the food that he's kept for himself and all the horses and the chariots will no longer be his. Jesus will say that those who store up treasures and wealth for themselves are not rich towards God, are not living as God wants them to live. You know what, but I take back what I said. I don't think I like this Jesus. Well, I do like Jesus. I love Jesus because Jesus will remind the people that they are to be people of my love, that they are to care for one another, that the crops that are grown are to be shared so that no one is hungry, that weapons of war will never bring the peace of living in right relationship with all my creation, that the greatest of all things is not wealth, but love. You know what, Todd? I'm not really sure that it is God I'm talking to. I bet you're just some phone soliciting scam trying to get some of my money. Well, I'm not falling for it. I'm saying goodbye now, God. He says. From now on, I'll feel a lot better if I don't take any messages from God. And Jesus will also say, love one another as I have loved you. Hannah and Crystal share with us grace like rain.
Please, we add amen and amen. The work of the church is supported in many ways, and that includes financially, and so offerings have been placed onto the table, and they have been given through the PAR program, and they have been given, support has been given through the collecting of pop cans and all kinds of ways in which people support the ministry of the church. And so for all of those things, we bring our offerings to God. I invite you to remain seated as we sing our offertory prayer, which will be followed by uh, our, our offertory call to prayer, which will be followed by a short prayer as we come before God today. Your work, O oh God, needs many hands. Pray for all who are victims of 
violence, God, we pray for those who experience domestic abuse, for those targeted by bullies, for those killed and injured by gun violence. We pray for the safety of all people. We pray for a world disarmed with weapons. We pray for a world in which people do not have to live in fear of the prejudices, hates, and cruelty of others. We pray, God, for those experiencing devastation in so many ways. We pray for people in Kentucky after flash flooding led to deaths and destruction of homes. We pray for planet Earth and all its creatures as climate change causes heat waves, flooding, rising ocean levels, and drought. We pray, God, that we as human beings become agents of healing for your world. We pray, God, in this world for food to be shared. We pray for all who suffer and endure hunger. We pray for those in hospitals. We pray for those undergoing medical treatment. We pray for those living with health challenges. We pray, pray for those living with emotional challenges. We pray for healing. We pray for courage and for trust in your ever-embracing love. We pray for hope, God, during times of uncertainty and anxiety. And we pray for all who follow the way of Jesus. May we live as bearers of your love and Christ's peace. May we live as people who see the image of Christ in all people. May we be people of healing and reconciliation. May we live as pilgrims of your new creation. We pray, God, in the name and spirit of Jesus the Christ. And together, God, we join our voices in saying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory.
service of worship has ended, but our service of God continues as we go forth from this place to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. Let us go knowing we go in the amazing grace of God, in the transforming friendship of Jesus the Christ, and in the healing power and presence of the Holy Spirit, now and always. We sing, I am walking a path of peace.